expanding minds and hearts to reach for the reality of heaven. This is Fathom Ministries Podcast. Brothers and sisters, to another Fathom Ministries podcast. This one I'm very excited about because, as you know, my ministry is called Fathom Ministries because I think it's important to have as our Christian goal to get to heaven. Uh, God has saved us not so we can have the most fantastic life and abundant life here and now, uh, but so that we can live eternally with Him in heaven. And where he is, that's where we want to be. I would be put off if I were God and I were to look down upon my people as they're praying. And I found someone speaking to me and I decided to talk to them. And I said, son, what would make your day better than anything else that I could do for you? Just think, if God asked that question and he was hoping that his bride would be, Lord, come back, Lord Jesus, take me to heaven, take the church to heaven, I want to be with you more than anything else, that's all I care about. That's what a normal bride would be saying to her husband if he were away. But what we would probably be saying is, Lord, make me successful. I need more money. I need a better job. I need a job I could like. I need you to heal me. I need you to thrill me. Uh, Lord, I just need to be happy while I'm on earth. And I could just imagine his dejected countenance as he thinks, why in the world does not my bride love me? That's the way I look at it. When it comes to this subject, that is the rapture of the church. I want to cover one aspect of this today, and that aspect is going to be those who believe in a post-tribulation rapture. That is, I want to talk to you about people who believe uh, in the fact that the rapture isn't going to take place before the Great Tribulation, which, by the way, is called Jacob's Trouble, Uh, Does any of you know the other name for Jacob? It's called Israel. The the seven-year period of trouble that's coming on the face of the earth is for Israel's sake uh, and not for the Gentile church. But nevertheless, um, uh, even though I am absolutely 110% convinced that Jesus is coming back before Jacob's trouble, I know there's a lot of you that I love and I respect that have not yet made the commitment to study this in such a way that you can be determined and and secure in this same fact that I am. So when I talk about this, I want to give you the details of why you should not hold any other view because it is not the truth of the Word of God. Not because it's a heaven or hell issue, we always go to that statement, but because it can create great joy and and satisfaction in knowing that God loves you enough that he's not going to put you under the spout where his wrath comes out during a time that's going to be worse than anything the world has ever seen. Have you heard about Hitler? Have you heard about World War II? Have you heard about Pol Pot? Have you heard about what happened in the Soviet Union under communism. None of that compares to the very horror that's coming on the face of the earth. And there are too many people that are so disinterested in being with the Lord that they think the Lord has the same feeling, I guess, that he is not looking forward to bringing them into heaven. 
to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And so I want to convince you that this is not the case. And the only way to do that is to get into the details of what post-tribulationists believe. I will do another uh, podcast on mid-tribulationists and some other aspects of what some people believe. And I'll show you why those things can't be true. But today, instead of being on the positive side and teaching you about what is going to be the pre-tribulation rapture, I am going to go into what those believe that believe in the post-tribulation rapture. First of all, I want to make sure nobody thinks the rapture is some kind of a myth or that it is simply uh, an idea that, uh, that, that people can pass off as if it's not real. So let me give you the basic scriptures that pertain to the rapture of the church. It all starts in John chapter 14. Jesus said the night before he went to his crucifixion as he was uh, talking so much to his disciples, uh, which are found in the 14th and subsequent chapters of John before the crucifixion. Here's what he said in John uh, 14, 1 through 3. Do not let your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many dwelling places or mansions, as the King James Version says. If it were not so, I would have told you. For I go to prepare a place for you, And if I go, sorry, and isn't there. If I go and prepare a place for you, listen closely, I will come again and receive you to myself that where I am there, you may be also. Real quickly, very simple, plain English language here for you to understand, for me to understand. Where did he go? He went to his father's house. What was he doing? He was preparing a place for his disciples. What was his promise? I'm going to come back and I'm going to receive you to myself that where I am, there you may be also. He just talked about heaven. He just said he's going to make space and dwelling places for his people. And then he's going to come get them and receive them to himself to be there. So that's clearly talking about the rapture. It is not talking about the second coming. The first thing you need to know is don't confuse the two events. Jesus is coming back to the earth to rule and reign for a thousand years. That's the second coming. He is going to appear to the church and receive them up into heaven to be where he is. That's the rapture. That is not the second coming. The If you look up in a, in a Bible dictionary, the word appearing, you will find in the New Testament, in the epistles, every time it's talking about him appearing, it's talking about the rapture. It is not talking about him coming back physically to the face of the earth and, and creating the chaos and the takeover that he's going to do when that happens. At that time, that event is going to require every eye to see him and everyone's going to know he's coming and they're going to know when he's coming. The rapture happens secretly. It is only for the church. They are the only ones who know it because they're participating in it. So anyway, that's the first verse, uh, the first passage I want to share with you. First Thessalonians 4.13 But we do not want you to be uninformed, brethren, about those who are asleep, that means dead, so that you will not grieve as do the rest who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus, those who have died. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive, notice that he's including himself, so he thinks he's going to go as a living person, Paul does. We who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord, this is not the second coming, this is the appearing of the Lord to the church, as I just demonstrated, unto the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep. We will not go ahead of those who have died. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with a voice of the archangel and with the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ will rise first. 
then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them, the dead, in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we shall always be with the Lord. This merges perfectly with John 14, where he says, I'm going to receive you to myself that where I am, meaning not here, but there, there you will be also. And then in verse 18, it says, therefore comfort one another with these words. If this is the second coming, there is no comfort to those words, because that means you have a dreaded seven year period of the wrath of God going to be poured out on the face of the earth in a way that has never been done before. It is going to be the most frightening thing and the most horrifying thing that could ever happen on the face of the earth, nor will ever happen. And so there would be no comfort, even if you're thinking the comfort is that he's coming back and, you know, lift up your head, your redemption draws nigh. No, that is not going to be a comfort at all to those people because it is going to be so horrific. Besides that, almost everybody saved during that time are going to give their life for their salvation. It is not going to be something that is anticipated to be so many living people going to heaven. So really important to look at the details of these scriptures and know exactly what you're looking at when you do it. For example, let's turn to Revelation chapter 7 verse 9. After these things I looked and behold a great multitude which no man could count from every nation and all tribes and peoples and tongues standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes, and palm branches were in their hand. And they cry out with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God, who sits on the throne, and to the Lamb. And all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures, and they fell on their faces before the throne, and worshiped God. Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. It says, Then one of the elders answered, saying to me, These who are clothed in white robes, who are they and where have they came from? Now notice how the text is highlighting a particular group of people who are mysterious for who they are and where they came from. And they are a single group, not a large group that spans a lot of time, a single small group, not a small amount of people. I don't mean that, but I mean a grouping in time that was small. And so John replies in verse 14, and John said to him, my Lord, you know, and he said to me, John, these are the ones who came out of the great tribulation and they have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the lamb. For this reason, they, this group, are before the throne of God, not in the throne, as we're promised as church members, but they're before the throne of God, and they serve him day and night in his temple, and he who sits on the throne will spread his tabernacle over them. And here again, just this group. They are so small in that they are only those distinguished as coming through the great tribulation. They will hunger no longer, nor thirst any more, nor will the sun beat down on them, nor any heat. For the lamb in the center of the throne will be their shepherd and will guide them to springs of water of life, and God will wipe every tear from their eyes. What I think is so significant about this is this is the group that gets saved during the Great Tribulation, and they are a singular group of people who, by the way, were not raptured. They're not in heaven as a result of being raptured to heaven because they are there based upon being slaughtered. They were slaughtered and brought to heaven, 
and they were before the throne of God, not in the throne of God. And so all of these things are uh, designated to this single group that does not have the view of the larger church in it. So this should be so clear when you see this kind of evidence that the people saved during the Great Tribulation are a select group of people, and they are separate and different from the church. And finally, this group appears again in Revelation in the 20th chapter, verse 4, where they are getting ready to be resurrected and get their glorified bodies. And it says this, Then I saw thrones, and they sat on them, and judgment was given to them. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of the testimony of Jesus and because of the word of God, and those who had not worshipped the beast or his image and had not received the mark in their forehead or on their hand, and they came to life, that's resurrection, and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. And notice this all happens without a rapture. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were completed. This is the first resurrection. So this group, first identified in chapter 6 and 7, and then showing what happens with them coming to life in the earth. So they're in heaven as spirits. They're on the earth in, ver in chapter 20 as resurrected saints who are ready to go into the uh, millennial kingdom and rule and reign with Christ along with the church. So when you go to the book of Revelation and you see the 24 elders, that's the church. They're sitting in the throne and they are the group that has the white robes. And in Revelation 1, 2, and 3, that is what is promised. White robes to the saints, the church saints. Chapters 1, 2, and 3 of Revelation is the church. It's about the church. The last time you see the church on the earth in Revelation is Revelation chapter 3. So this is very important, very important. Uh, very cool to be able to take the microscope and get this together and look at this. Is this Nathan Reynolds theology? No, this is Nathan Reynolds theology borrowed from the Bible knowledge commentary. My favorite theologians, Dwight, Pentecost, and Walvard. I think his name is John Walvard. Look it up yourself. Get a Bible knowledge commentary or go online, look it up. It's free and you can see what I'm talking about. This is that. Now, I want to establish for you the concept of the 24 elders being the church, and I want you to understand how important this is to understand all of these things. First of all, our position is to be in the throne of God, not before the throne, not away from the throne, but in the throne. I want to establish that first, and that starts with Matthew 25, 31. Jesus says, but when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious th throne. And then in Luke twenty-two thirty, that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and you will sit on thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. And then in Revelation three twenty-one, this one is key because this is to the church not just to the 12 apostles. He who overcomes, that's more than apostles, I will grant to him to sit down with me on my throne as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. Now here is the significance of the 24 elders. It's Revelation 4.4. 4. Around the throne were 24 thrones. And upon the thrones, I saw 24 elders sitting clothed in white raiment and golden crowns on their head. Now listen to this, ladies and gentlemen. This I have researched from John Walvard. Who are the 24 elders? Here's the reason to believe they represent the raptured church believers. A. They are seated in thrones in the throne room of Almighty God and this precise location is is promised to the church who overcame the world through faith in Jesus Christ. There are no scriptures indicating that any other group, including angels, will ever be granted this privilege, except for the church. B, they being clothed in white garments is one of the strongest indications of who they are. Four, 
There are only three references in the entire Bible to those who are given this type of robes, and it is only promised to the church in three places in the same book of Revelation. C. They are crowned with golden crowns, and the book of Revelation knows two types of crowns. There is the crown that a ruler wears representing governmental authority, and then there is something called the victor's crown, one that is awarded to someone who has won a game of skill and perseverance. The word indicated here on the heads of the 24 elders is not the one of governmental authority, but it is actually the one of the victor. D. Another great significance here is that the 24 elders already have their victor's crown showing that they have attended the judgment seat of Christ and they've received their, re- their heavenly rewards at the awards banquet. Before any of the tribulation events of the subsequent chapters, that's chapters 5 through 19, uh, take place. This is so important because there is no other time given Uh, where the church would be able to do all of these things before the millennial kingdom of Christ and his second advent. E, beyond the aforementioned details, some theologians claim that these elders may be angels or even Israel. This is unlikely due to the fact that it appears that both the judgment of angels determining their rewards and final estate comes much later. And likewise, it appears that Israel's judgment also seems to happen at the end of the Great Tribulation, not before it. Only the church is in its complete and final state, having been either taken alive into heaven at the rapture or, in the case of those who have died, having first been resurrected and then rising in the rapture along with the living believers are the first group that God gathers together and then compensates them with heavenly eternal gifts and rewards prior to any of the other groups, that is, Israel, angels, uh, and lastly, non-believers. This is F. Thrones are seats of government, authority, and are realized through designated power by higher authority, and this world will be in keeping with the promises of Jesus Christ to his church. It is ironic that this is the exact position Satan desired to set his heart on achieving and which God adamantly declared he would not achieve. Finally, why the number 24? This number shows it to be a representative group that are clearly paralleled to the Old Testament where the priesthood was represented on a consistent basis by 24 priests at any given time. The actual number of priests numbered in the thousands, but they could not all minister at the same time. Accordingly, they were divided into 24 orders, each of which was represented by a priest. When these 24 priests uh, met together, they represented the whole priesthood as well as the whole nation of Israel. These notes are a summary of items derived from John Walford's book, The Revelation of Jesus Christ, and it's combined with my own thoughts, Nathan Reynolds. And of course, I've got a lot more arguments that I'll be sharing with you uh, as we go along. There's one more place in scripture that talks about the rapture, and this place is found Uh, also by uh, the Apostle Paul, who wrote 1 Corinthians 15. And he basically says, um, if you go to um, kind of scrolling along here to the right place. um, So it says in verse 47, the first man is from earth, earthly, uh, earthy. The second man is from heaven, as is the earthy so also are those who are earthy, and as is the heavenly, so also are those who are heavenly. Just as we have borne the image of the earthy, uh, we also will bear the image of the heavenly, talking about Christ. Now look, here it gets good. Now I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Look in the mirror right now. Look at your face. Look at your body. That cannot inherit the kingdom of God. That's what it's saying. Nor does perishable inherit the imperishable. What you're looking at in the mirror is perishable. If it can die, then it's perishable. And it is not going to inherit the imperishable. But here is the truth. And the, the key here is that this is a mystery. Um, behold, I tell you a mystery. A mystery is something that is a secret. Only God knows and only God can reveal. No one can figure it out until God reveals it by self-revelation through his prophets. Paul says, look, 
I tell you a mystery. We will not all die sleep, but we will all be changed, dead and resurrected, dead and living. All are going to be changed because flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. In verse 52, this is the rapture in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, not the batting of an eye, in the twinkling of an eye. That's how fast light glances off the eye at the last trumpet for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable and we will be changed. Now we know that the dead here is only talking about the church because of uh, what was written in Thessalonians. It specifies it to be the church. Same person teaching us here. Verse 53, for this perishable, look in the mirror again, that's what he's talking about, your body, must put on the imperishable, the new body, and this mortal, your body, must put on immortality. But when this perishable will have put on the imperishable and this mortal will have put on immortality, then will come about the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your toil is not in vain in the Lord. All right, excitedly, I come to you, and I'm going to present to you an alternative view that I don't believe in, that is the post-tribulation. Post means after the great tribulation rapture. For some reason, people have envisioned that God is going to come for his people at the same time that he comes to set up his kingdom on earth. And yet, in the very moment that that happens, it's going to be at the end of the great tribulation period, which is called Jacob or Israel's trouble, the 70th week of Daniel, very commonly known and spoken about and read about. And it is this period of time that some people envision the church going through it. So here's what they believe. Uh, first of all, post-tribulationists believe that the church will not be removed from the earth until the second advent of Christ at the very end of the present age. They believe the church is going through the great tribulation. They also believe that the church is going to endure the complete affliction of the Antichrist and all of God's judgments listed in the book of Revelation. One of the things I see people make the mistake of constantly is they're confused with the word tribulation. Because the scripture says in the world you're going to have tribulation. Church history is that there have been many martyrs and um, people giving their life for the sake of the gospel. And they've confused the issue of God's judgment and his wrath being poured out as being um, synonymous with the idea that this is the tribulation that he said we're going to have in the world. That is not the case. The Great Tribulation period is a period of time not known to be the time of persecution because of God's wrath. God's wrath will have nothing to do with the persecution of the believers during that time. And so uh, you might be thinking, well, if you don't believe the church is going to go through the Great Tribulation, then how is there going to be believers during that time? I'm so glad you brought that up because it is so true. There will be believers. They will be uh, uh, believing in Christ and they will, in many cases, be giving their life because the Antichrist will take it from them because they will not submit to his earthly edicts to receive the mark of the beast and all of the things that are involved in that. But the bottom line is, is when you get to the book of Revelation and you see those people standing in the book of Revelation in heaven, where they have been martyred and now are in heaven, uh, they are standing before the throne of God as a separate group of people who are only those who are saved during the time of the Great Tribulation. Ladies and gentlemen, the church age started 2,000 years ago, and there has been hundreds and hundreds of thousands if not probably millions of people who have died and have gone to heaven and who are presently in heaven 
waiting for the culmination of all things so that they can receive their new bodies, which they won't get until the resurrection. And so they are there in spirit. They are uh, in the throne of God. And so this is a very key point that is, is very important. So those people that are saved during the time of the tribulation are not considered a part of the church, the church age. They are actually being saved in the same way that the thief on the cross was saved and in the same way that anyone else was saved before Jesus Christ established the church. The thief on the cross died and went to heaven. Jesus said, you will be to, today with me in paradise. And so, yeah, he was saved, but is he a part of the church? No, he was not a part of the church. And so, because the church didn't start until the book of Acts chapter 2. So, very important to understand that God's program of saving people is not limited to the church uh, from now on because he is actually going to be turning back to his program with the nation of Israel and he's going to be saving them through the gospel of the kingdom, which was preached by Jesus and John the Baptist and his disciples while Jesus was still alive and he had not yet been crucified. Very important difference between that and what happened after they rejected Jesus and there was no millennial kingdom given to the Jews because they had rejected him and God turned to the church, the Gentile church, and he made room for us to be a part of his program that is separate and distinct from what he's doing with the nation of Israel. Our position in this program is to rule and reign with Christ for those thousand years, not to occupy Israel, but to be a part of the ruling of that time through Christ in the earth and to be at the top of God's echelon of power and authority to help to do the things that he's going to do. That's going to be so exciting. So anyway, those who believe in the post-tribulation rapture, uh, really, really uh, have their sights set on going through the tribulation. And of course, today they're right now getting ready for the Antichrist. The post-tribulationist doctrine rests on a denial of the distinctions between the nation of Israel and the church. This is the first problem that exists that makes this confusing. Post-tribulationism denies the scriptural teaching concerning the nature and the purpose of the tribulation period. The purpose that the scripture assigns to this time is a pouring out of judgment uh, on sin, and it's going to hit both the Jews and the Gentiles who are in the world because they have not received the testimony of Jesus Christ, and they have not received the love for the truth, and they missed their opportunity during the church age. Post-tribulationists also must deny all distinctions between the second advent, that's the second coming of Christ, and the rapture of the church. They need to make them one event in order to see things the way that they are intending it to be fulfilled. Post-tribulationists must deny the doctrine of imminence. If you are a post-tribulationist, you do not believe Jesus Christ could come back today, nor could he have come back for the last 2,000 years, and nor could he come back at any time in the future until the Antichrist is revealed, until he sets himself up as God, and he requires people to worship him, until two witnesses come from heaven preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and until they are killed, until they are delivered, and until you count off the very end days of the tribulation, which is three and a half years, depicted by actual days in the book of Revelation, where it tells you it's going to be exactly and specifically uh so many days, which amounts to three and a half years. And it tells you the day that it starts. So it tells you the day that Jesus will come back. And right there, you're going to say, wait a minute. I thought, I thought you didn't know the day or the hour. You're right. You don't know the day or the hour until all those things are fulfilled. And then you are going to be able to ascertain exactly when he's coming back because it says, that there's going to be so many days. And it says, furthermore, that if you make it to the next period, the day after that, that you are going to be blessed. And it's actually telling people to try to survive until after that particular day, because after that day, 
there is going to be a great rejoicing and a great reprieve. Okay, I want to pause and make a quick explanation of what I mean by these days. In Daniel chapter 12, verse 11, it says, From the time that the regular sacrifice is abolished and the abomination of desolation is set up, there will be 1,290 days. Verse 12, How blessed is he who keeps waiting and attains to the 1,335 days. So, um, it is not the next day. There is actually, it looks like, about 45 days that is in between these two numbers that is said to be blessed. And most think that this is the amount of time it takes from the coming of Christ, the second advent, to him taking care of administrative task for these 45 days. And then on the 1335th day, it will be the inauguration of the millennial kingdom. That is what I mean by the count. Now, I keep saying three and a half years, and what I mean is three and a half years of the latter half of the 70th week of Daniel. The 70th week of Daniel, as you probably know, is divided into two halves. One half of it is going to be the time that is going to be the labor pains, and it's going to be the time where trouble is mounting, but on the surface, it looks like peace, and it looks like Israel is being helped by the Antichrist. But in the middle of the week is the desolation that causes, uh, I mean, the abomination that causes desolation, which we just read about. And that means that the temple is going to be desecrated, and the Antichrist is going to set himself up as God, and this is going to mark the beginning of the end. If you know what day that is, you can start counting days to the second coming of Christ. It's 1,290 days. And if you know what day that is, you can also count to 1,335 days, and if you endure to that day, you will be blessed. If you make it to that time, you will be blessed. That's what I'm referring to. I mistakenly said it's in the book of Revelation, but it's actually here in the book of Daniel. Once again, I mistakenly am saying you, and I really don't mean you, and I don't mean me, because I don't believe we are going to be here. So what I mean by you is very generic. Those who are going through this, not me, not you, I don't think we are. I believe 100% that we are going to Uh, be taken out of here before any of this takes place. As a matter of fact, I don't think we'll ever know the identity of the Antichrist from this world. I think in heaven we'll know, but not here. So I apologize for not making it clear when I say you. Don't mistake that to mean you in particular. I mean those who are here during this time. So the coming of the Lord in the second advent is not going to be a a silent coming. It's not going to be an unexpected coming. It's not going to be uh, when the time comes. Now, I'm not talking about now. Nobody in the world's expecting it now. But when the time comes and the clock starts counting down, then these things are going to be known. And that's why it cannot possibly be that the Bible's talking about one event, the rapture and the second advent as one thing, because they are completely contrary to one another. So the doctrine of imminence is really important. And that means uh, for us who believe in a pre-tribulation rapture, it means that the scripture, which we just read to you, says uh, that Paul was expecting the Lord to come at the time that he wrote those verses. And he said, when we who are alive and remain, will be caught up together to meet the Lord in the air. He was expecting to be part of that we who are alive and remain. That means that Paul believed in the imminent return of Christ. You cannot possibly believe that if you believe that you're going to go through the 70th week of Daniel because it hasn't even begun. So therefore, there would be no way that Christ could return uh, to earth right now. So uh, you have to discard the doctrine of imminence, which is clearly taught in the Bible, Uh, in order to believe in a post-tribulation rapture. Number five, post-tribulationists deny any future fulfillment to the prophecy of Daniel 9, 24 to 27. They claim that it's already fulfilled. Okay, so you might ask, what is Daniel 9, 24 through 27? Some of the most powerful, prophetic, futuristic scripture in the whole Bible. Let me read it to you. Seventy weeks have been decreed for your people and your holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sin, 
to make atonement for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy place. So you are to know and discern that from the issuing of a decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until Messiah, the Prince, there will be seven weeks and 62 weeks. It will be built again with the plaza and the moat, even in times of distress. Then after the 62 weeks, the Messiah will be cut off and have nothing. And the people of the Prince who is to come will destroy the city and the sanctuary. And its end will come with a flood. Even to the end, there will be war. Desolations are determined. And he will make a firm covenant with the many for one week. So what we call the 70th week of Daniel. But in the middle of the week, he will put a stop to sacrifice and grain offering. And on the wing of abominations will come one who makes desolate, even until a complete destruction. One that is decreed is poured out on the one who makes desolate. So, if you believe in a post-tribulation rapture, then you will also find that those who teach on this do not believe in the fulfillment of that prophecy. And so, this is crazy because the book of Revelation is all about this and it's very important to understand that. Post-tribulationists must apply major portions of scripture that outline God's program for Israel. They have to substitute it and you know put it over to the church in order to support its views. This is called substituting uh, the church for Israel or substitution theology, a very crazy practice that is absolutely heretical. You cannot find that practice in the Bible. It is only those with wild imaginations who have decided to make Israel the same as the church and the church the same as Israel. It just isn't the case. So let's talk about the historical argument from silence. This is one of the things that is claimed. Post-tribulationists argue that the concept of pre-tribulation is new since the church fathers from about 200 AD to 1900 did not hold this view. But because we get closer and closer to the end, and because Israel is now a nation again, the church would not have expected it to be something that they could expect because most of the last 2,000 years, there wasn't even a nation of Israel. So they couldn't make sense out of it. This makes perfect sense to me because uh, if you see that the book of Revelation speak, speaks about sacrifices, which right now doesn't happen, and speaks about a temple, which right now Israel doesn't have, then we know that for those prophecies to come to pass, there has to be an Israel, there has to be a temple, there has to be sacrifices. Well, none of that sounds too far-fetched now because we live since 1948 with the nation of Israel in existence. And so, of course, that really heated up Bible prophecy interest. And, of course, since then, it has been a boon. And it has been very, very interesting to see how things in the world are lining up with what the Bible spoke of 2,000 years ago. But uh, those who want to keep with the post-tribulation argument, their days are going to be short-lived because very soon they're going to see more and more events that were uh, postulated in prophecy in the Scripture taking place, and they'll be less and less likely to harbor this view. Uh, Their view is also that with the 1800 years of silence about the issue, that's the way they feel about it, that somehow that's going to prove that something as important as this could not have went on undiscovered. Once again, you'd got to understand the Holy Spirit over those 1800 years would not be pressing upon people to be interested in the subject because the Holy Spirit knows when this is going to take place. So it stands to reason that the focus of the church and the focus of the Holy Spirit would not have been on this particular subject. And so this uh, particular argument from silence really doesn't hold any water, in my opinion. The same line of reasoning would not accept the doctrine of justification by faith, for instance. For it was not taught until the Reformation period and when Martin Luther came along. So 
If you use the uh, argument from silence, then you can throw out that you're justified by faith alone. Um, Failure of the church in history to recognize any truth that's in the Bible and clearly taught does not counsel out that truth. It's very important to understand. The early church, that's those who wrote the New Testament, practiced this teaching even though subsequent generations lost the truth of it. Their clear expectation was that Christ might return at any time and at any moment. So there was this doctrine of imminence. And as I said, even if they couldn't explain it the way we explain it today, the early church fathers, many of them spoke of Christ coming back as if it were imminent. So they could not have thought through their particular views on prophecy if they still believed that Jesus could come at any time. And I suspect some of you who are holding to this view has not thought through some of these things because you would have to discard that view of imminency if you hold to this view. Pre-tribulationism is the only position consistent with this New Testament doctrine of imminence. So in other words, if you hold any other view other than uh, the pre-tribulation rapture view, you cannot hold to the doctrine of imminence. Now, one of my favorite authors on this subject is a man called J. Dwight Pentecost. He wrote a book called Things to Come. This book changed my life seven years ago when I spent a whole year reading his huge book, and learning all that he had to teach on this subject. I want to give a quote from him out of his book. It should be observed that each era of church history has been occupied with a particular doctrinal controversy, which has become the object of discussion, revision, and formulation until there was a general acceptation of what the scripture taught. The entire field of theology was thus formulated through the ages. It was not until the last century that the field of eschatology became a matter to which the mind of the church was turned. Now, I want to run through a quick chart that talks about this because it's really important. Doctrinal development over time was the church hashing out the issues. In the first and second century, apologetics introduced... uh, which is a defense and a rational justification of Christianity in conflict with paganism, the irreligious. So that was their battle then. And then in the third and the fourth century, systematic theology came to light. The Christian doctrine of God and his very nature as to how the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit all make up the one true God. This was the issue in those centuries. And then in the fifth century, anthropology became the issue Augustinian and Pelagian controversies in which interest shifts from God to man came about. And then we have Augustine's doctrine of original sin. And then in the 5th, 6th, and 7th centuries, Christology controversies involving the divine nature of Christ and how it relates to the nature of God came about. And then from the 5th through the 15th centuries was the medieval times where we didn't really have much progress in anything in society. And then after the 15th century, uh, the beginning of the Reformation took place, and it was a time of rediscovering the apostolic biblical teachings that had been completely ruined by the professed church, the Roman Catholic Church. And then in the 19th century was the time when the theology of eschatology, which is the study of last things, prophecies, were rediscovered and debated. So this is kind of, in looking back at what the Holy Spirit was doing, this is a bird's eye view of how all of that came about. And it makes a lot of sense because until you get the nation of Israel back in its country, you have to ask yourself, what is going to happen? When those who got the prophecies in the past had Israel and the temple and all of that fresh on their mind, they didn't see Bible prophecy as being something hard to understand. When we who have been here looking at the Bible since 1948, even though there's not a temple, we know that could be fixed very quickly. And so we're not put off through uh, what the Bible says about the Antichrist sitting himself down in the temple of God as if he were God and demanding that people worship him as God. We don't think that that is hard to fathom because we know how quickly they could 
put that temple together. As a matter of fact, there is a temple plan. There are temple preparations being made right now as we speak. I have actually been to the uh, Israel where I got to see the priestly garments that they've already got made for the priests to offer their sacrifices and to do their temple service. I've already been there. I've already seen this stuff take place and it's far further along now than it was even back then in the 90s when I went to Israel. So this is really important to understand and I hope you're interested because as the bride of Christ, you should be living your life waiting for the day when you get to see your Savior. Now, it is contradictory to pray for Christ's quick return while knowing that there's no way that he could come back uh, until this stuff takes place. The doctrine of imminency is clearly taught in Scripture and it was practiced by the apostles. John 14, 2 and 3. And I'm going to read this, by the way, a lot of the Scriptures in this lesson are going to be read out of the New Living Translation. And I'm doing that uh, because not because it changes anything, but because it makes it more clear and it makes it in everyday language. If you have any um, concern about the difference between your version of the Bible and this one, please just go along and read with your version. Uh, there's nothing nefarious going on here because I'm using this. It's just simply I'm trying to make this uh, understandable better for newer converts to the to the church, which is who I deal with more than anything else. John 14, 2 and 3, I read it out of the NASB, the New American Standard Bible, which is my, uh, my normal Bible that I use all the time. But this one is out of the New Living Translation. There is more than enough room in my father's home. If this were not so, would I have told you that I am going to prepare a place for you? When everything is ready, I will come and get you so that you will always be with me where I am. And here again, where is he? in his father's house where he's preparing the place. This is so clear. I can't believe anybody wants to change it. First Corinthians 1 7 goes on to say, now you have every spiritual gift you need as you eagerly wait for the return of our Lord Jesus Christ. Philippians 3 20 and 21. But we, the church, are citizens of heaven where the Lord Jesus Christ lives and we are eagerly waiting for him to return as our savior he will take our weak mortal bodies and change them into glorious bodies like his own using the same power with which he will bring everything under his control first thessalonians 1 10 and they speak of how you are looking forward to the coming of god's son from heaven jesus whom god raised from the dead he is the one who has rescued us from the terrors of the coming judgment. What? He's rescued us from the terrors of the coming judgment. I wonder what that could be. That is certainly talking about the coming days of wrath that are going to happen as the book of Revelation outlines in the chapters after chapter three. So uh, it is so important to understand this and then those of you that want to go through the Great Tribulation, I, I promise you that, um, you know, this is not going to change your destination. If the Lord comes before, even though you're not looking for him, um, I believe you're going to go to heaven and then you're going to be in real happy shock that you didn't have to go through the Great Tribulation. But wouldn't it be nice if you could live your life here now, believing this scripture that says that Jesus, when he comes back, has the purpose of delivering or rescuing you from the terrors of the coming judgment. So um, this is what's going to happen. Um, and I know that you could take this as being the judgment of the final judgment. Uh, you could take this uh, in that way if you want to, but that's not what it's talking about. Because in the book of Revelation itself, it says, I'm going to deliver you one of the particular churches written there, I'm going to deliver you from the hour of trial that's coming on the face of the whole world. And that hour of trial does not happen at the end when Jesus Christ comes back. That's the end of the hour of trial. That's going to be putting a cap on the hour of trial. Yes, it's going to be terrorizing for a moment when Jesus comes back because he's going to be killing a lot of people in, in actual uh, armed conflict that's going on there. But 
that hour of trial is more than just the second coming. It culminates in the second coming, but it lasts for seven years. And the worst part of it is the last three and a half years. So this is the terrors of coming judgment that God has promised to deliver us from. And if you uh, if you just read it and take it at face value, it makes it very clear. And then, of course, we have 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a commanding shout, with a voice of the archangel and with a trumpet call of God. First, the Christians who have died will be will rise from their graves. And then together with them, we who are still alive and remain on the earth will be caught up in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And then we will be with the Lord forever. It's over at that point for us. We are with the Lord and it's final. It's going to be wherever he goes, we're with him. And it's not going to be a U-turn to come back to earth to bring judgment on the earth. It's going to be a, a trip to heaven to the marriage supper of the Lamb, and it's going to be a trip to heaven to do the uh, judgment that's called the judgment seat of Christ, where our works are going to be judged and our rewards are going to be handed out. I call it the rewards judgment. Now listen closely to 1 Thessalonians 5, 5 through 9. For you are all children of the light and of the day. We don't belong to the darkness and night. So be on your guard, not asleep like others. Stay alert and be clear-headed. Night is the time when people sleep and drinkers get drunk. But let us who live in the light be clear-headed, protected by the armor of faith and love, and wearing as our helmet the confidence of our salvation. Our salvation. What's that salvation from? It's In this case, it's not just talking about sin. It's talking about the salvation from this time of wrath, just like the previous scripture said. You say, oh, no, I, I don't think so. I think this is talking about our sin. Well, then read on next verse and you'll see it's not. Verse 9, for God chose to save us through our Lord Jesus Christ, not to pour out his anger on us. What could be clearer? Oh, my goodness. This is so clear. I have read you scripture after scripture promising you this salvation. Why do you want to maintain that you're going to endure the great tribulation? I don't understand that. Anyway, moving on. James 5, 8. You too. Hey, that's you. You and me must be patient. Take courage for the coming of the Lord is near. You can't say that if you don't believe that Jesus can come back. You can't say it's near because you know it can happen for seven years at least if the great tribulation period of seven years started today. Now, I know I'm not really being completely accurate when I classify the great tribulation with a full seven years. So just grant me that laxity because I just hate to stop and distinguish between the first half and the second half of the seven years. The great tribulation period is the half that's the last half. So I know that, you know that. So if I keep referring to the whole period as the great tribulation, forgive me. I really mean it as a unit of the 70th week of Daniel. And we know it culminates in the great tribulation, but the first half is not going to feel like the great tribulation. It's going to feel like peace and safety on the earth. And it's going to look like man and Antichrist are actually working out a peaceful solution to the world's problems. So James tells us, you, you just wait, be patient, take courage, because Jesus is coming is near. And uh, so in other words, what you're waiting for is not the great tribulation. You're waiting for Jesus to come back. Revelations 3.10, this is the main one. This is in the book of Revelation. This is said before chapter 4 begins. And this says, because you have obeyed my command to persevere, I, Jesus, this is red letters, will protect you from the great, there's the word, great time of testing that will come upon the whole world to test those who belong to this world. Now, recently I had a discussion with one of my uh, pastor friends, a dear brother who is uh, tottering on the fence on this issue. And uh, he, I asked him explicitly about this particular verse. And I said, well, so what are you going to do with this verse? 
And he wrote back and he said, well, that verse was to that church at that time. And so I got to say, uh, first of all, yes, in a literal sense, it was to that church at that time. But did God mean it for them um, in a first hand setting or did he mean it for us because he had uh, John write this in the book of Revelation and it was really more for the typical church that was going to be existing in that day. He couldn't have possibly meant it uh, literally for that church because that church wasn't anywhere near this period of time. And so for sure they didn't go through it. So it worked out for them. But was it for them? Now, let me take you to the Bible Knowledge Commentary. And what he says uh, in the Bible Knowledge Commentary is he quotes the verse, I will also keep you from the hour of trial that is going to come upon the whole world to test those who live on the earth. And and here's what he says. I'm I'm reading verbatim from the commentary. This is an explicit promise that the Philadelphia church will not endure the hour of trial, which is unfolding beginning in Revelation 6. Christ was saying that the Philadelphia church would not enter the future time of trouble. He could not have stated it more explicitly. If Christ had meant to say that, they would be preserved through the time of trouble, which is what you would have to believe if you believe in a post-tribulation rapture, or would be taken out from within the tribulation if you believed in the mid-tribulation rapture. Uh, I'm still reading from his his commentary here, a different verb and a different pre, uh, preposition would have been required. Those scholars have attempted to avoid this conclusion in order to affirm post-tribulationism, the combination of the verb, quote-unquote, keep, uh, with the preposition, quote-unquote, from, is in sharp contrast to the meaning of keeping the church through which would be dia, a preposition which is not used here. The expression, the hour of trial, which is a time period, makes it clear that they would be kept out of that period. It is difficult to see how Christ could have made this promise to this local church if it were God's intention for the entire church to go through the tribulation Uh, that will come on the entire world. Even though the church at Philadelphia would go to glory via death long before the time of trouble would come, if the church here is taken to be typical of the body of Christ, standing true to the faith, the promise seems to go beyond the Philadelphia church to all those who are believers in Christ. Now that is a great, solid theological statement from one of the greatest theologians of our time. And he has just said to us that this is really meant for us today because we, if we are in the last days, I don't want to assume that because if I die before the Lord comes, then it wasn't to me. But whoever is in the last day when Jesus comes, he's telling them, I am going to protect you from the time of testing that's going to come up on the whole world and I am going to save you from it. He used the Greek language to show that in the original Greek, which was what this letter was written in, it was explicitly saying that he would have used different words if he was trying to say that the saving from the Great Tribulation would be saving them from it in the sense of protecting them as they go through it. And he said it wouldn't have even been stated in that sense. So I hope you pay attention to what people Uh, that are very learned in the language are saying. Now, in Revelations 22, 17 through 20, we have this wonderful, wonderful statement by Jesus. The spirit and the bride say, come. Let anyone who hears this say, come. Let anyone who is thirsty, come. Let anyone who desires drink freely from the water of life. And I solemnly declare to everyone who hears the words of the prophecy written in this book, if anyone adds anything to what is written here, God will add to that person the plagues described in this book. Look at that. The plagues described in this book are are used here as a threat to someone who is going to misuse this book. It is saying that if you don't misuse this book, the plagues in this book will not fall on you. Isn't it? Isn't that the inference here? 
Otherwise, this threat would be meaningless. You could change all the scriptures you want to. You would be going through the plague. And look at how it uses the word plague. It's very similar to what happened with Egypt and how God poured out his wrath on Egypt. And did he pour it out on the children of Israel? No. Verse 19, and if anyone removes any of the words from this book of prophecy, God will remove that person's share in the tree of life and in the holy city that are described in this book. Verse 20, he who is the faithful witness to all these things says, yes, I am coming soon. Amen. Come Lord Jesus. Could he say that if what he meant was there was no imminent threat of his imminent return? I really don't think so. I think you got to look at this very carefully. Now, let's look at the promise of tribulation. This is the one that seems to really get people confused. Scriptures directed exclusively at the nation of Israel are used by post-tribulationists to prove that the church is going to go through the tribulation. Post-tribulationists fail to see the distinction between normal trouble associated with being a believer and the great trouble that is God directed against the world during the time of the great tribulation. Their argument is that in light of specific promises concerning trouble or the tribulation period, the church cannot possibly be raptured before these promises are fulfilled. They feel that the persecutions in the book of Acts is a partial fulfillment of those many promised tribulations. Matthew 24, 9 through 13. Let's take a look at this. Then, this is, by the way, Jesus's words, New Living Translation. Then you will be arrested, persecuted, and killed. You will be hated all over the world because you are my followers. And many will turn away from me and betray and hate each other. And many false prophets will appear and will deceive many people. Sin will be rampant everywhere, and the love of many will grow cold. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. This is a sample of the scriptures that they are counting on. And it's amazing how many people hold to this tightly. This is the most important scripture to them. This one is it. This is the one that determines that they will never let go of the idea they're going to go through the Great Tribulation. But let's, let's analyze this. Number one, scripture abounds with warnings and promises to Israel that she is going to be brought to a time of purging to prepare her as a nation for the millennial kingdom to follow the advent of Christ. Does that not sound familiar? Jesus said it. John said it. John the Baptist, I mean. And of course, the prophets of old are filled with these warnings. Number two, the Bible student must distinguish how the term tribulation is being used in different ways throughout Scripture, especially the distinctions between when the, 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 the nation of Israel is in view in the Scripture and when the church is in view. The non-technical sense, that's non-eschatological, anytime suffering is one view that we have to look at. Okay, so tribulation just means trouble. It's not talking about prophecy of, of specific trouble. It's any time trouble. Now, there's the other one, and that's technical or eschatological sense, which is specifically in reference to the seven-year period of time, which half of it is the Great Tribulation, either in whole or in part. This is what we're talking about when we're talking about being delivered from the wrath to come, not the non-technical trouble, the persecution type trouble, even though that for individuals could be as bad as anything that's going to happen in the great tribulation. When they burn you at the stake and you're a martyr, that's about as bad as it gets, especially if they first burned your kids and your wife. And that has happened to Christians. But this is not what we're talking about. The church is never hear this. I challenge you find it, reach out to me, show me the proof the church is never warned about the great tribulation, but is explicitly promised to escape it, as I have shown you scripture after scripture. 
The post-tribulationists believe that there is only one resurrection for the saved dead. They know that the Old Testament saints which have died are resurrected at Christ's second advent, and they know that the dead church believers are also resurrected prior to the translation of the living saints. Therefore, they see this as only possible at the end, at the time of the second advent, which is the second coming of Christ to the earth to take charge and to put his kingdom in place. So let's talk about the answers to these things. Number one. One must recognize that Scripture divides the resurrection of the dead into two parts, because it happens in parts. A, there are those who are to be resurrected to eternal life and glory. That's being a part of the first resurrection. And then B, the second part is those who are resurrected to be judged and condemned. That is what happens at the end of all time. The first resurrection include resurrection events that happen at different points in time. If you get this, this is going to really turn the light on in your understanding. Christ was resurrected and brought a token of those who had recently died out of the graves with him at that time, at the same time. So interestingly enough, there has already been a first part to the first resurrection. And everyone who was resurrected were believers. And that's all that's going to be having part in this first part of the two-part resurrection. The resurrection of the church will take place just before the translation of the saints. That's the rapture event. And the resurrection of the Old Testament saints will take place at the second advent of Christ. They won't be raptured. They will simply be raised from the dead. And then number four, when the scriptures speak of those things happening on the day of the Lord, you hear that a lot in scripture, it is crucial to remember that The day of the Lord is not a 24-hour day, but in fact, is the whole period from the beginning of Daniel's 70th week, the tribulation period, to the end of the millennial age and the final great white throne judgment and the destruction of this earth. The day of the Lord is that whole time period. And when you are trying to mark the day of his return, that day is started at the same time as the day of the Lord. And that's why no man knows the hour or the day because nothing marks the beginning of that day and only God will know that day. John 5, 28 and 29, New Living Translation says, Don't be so surprised. Indeed, the time is coming when all the dead in their graves will hear the voice of God's Son and they will rise again. Those who have done good will rise to experience eternal life, and those who have continued in evil will rise to experience judgment. So here you have a classic example of the Bible talking about two events, two parts to a resurrection. And we already know Jesus is already raised. We already know that he raised some from the dead when he was raised. So there has already been some who have been raised, and yet they're not in view here if you take it literally that there can only be one event, one resurrection at the great white throne judgment. Uh, Doing that precludes any possibility that there's a millennial kingdom. It precludes any possibility that we have any of Jesus coming back to the earth happening except to, to bring judgment. And so you're really talking about a, what what we call a preacherist view. And, um, And this is so far off biblical uh, interpretation that it it makes no sense whatsoever. You see, if there is no resurrection until the final day, in other words, if there's only one resurrection, it couldn't even happen at the coming of Christ unless there was not going to be a thousand year kingdom, which is mentioned, by the way, three times in the book of Revelation as being a thousand years reigning of Christ. None of that could be possible because if God can only resurrect the dead once, he would have to wait till judgment day and then do it. And therefore, we would not be participants in the kingdom of Christ. And we would be still dead uh, whenever he comes back to rule. Because if we can't be resurrected until that final once and only resurrection, then nothing can happen till the end. None of this Uh, make sense with scripture and you really need to go back and read your Bible if you're believing this kind of thing. 
Let's look at Revelation 20, verses 4 through 6. Then I saw thrones, and the people sitting on them had been given the authority to judge. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their testimony about Jesus and for proclaiming the word of God. They had not worshipped the beast or his statue, nor accepted his mark on their forehead or their hands. They all came to life again, and they reigned with Christ for a thousand years. Huh? So they were resurrected before the thousand year reign? Wait a minute now. That's, that's kind of weird. This is the first resurrection, it says. The rest of the dead did not come back to life until the thousand years had ended. Blessed and holy are those who share in the first resurrection. For them, the second death holds no power, but they will be priests of God and of Christ and will reign with him a thousand years. So here you have people that were actually killed during the Great Tribulation as being those who are segmented as separate as a group and they being segmented as only this group that died during that time are resurrected. Why is that? Why is it not just saying, hey, the dead in Christ will rise and we who are alive and remain will be caught up together to meet the Lord in the air? Because this isn't the church. Because this isn't the same group. This isn't the same scenario. And so it has to be distinguished because they're not being raptured. They're being raised from the dead. And then they're going to turn around and join Christ who is already here. And by the way, you and I will already be here too, because we will have come back with Christ having been resurrected at least seven years prior to this. That is what the Bible teaches. Now let's go to the argument that's called the argument of the wheat and the weeds. And let's see what this says. In Matthew 13, 24 through 30, here's what it says. Here is another story Jesus told. The kingdom of heaven is like a farmer who planted good seed in his field. But that night, as the workers slept, his enemy came and planted weeds among the wheat, then slipped away. When the crop began to grow and produce grain, the weeds also grew. The farmer's workers went to him and said, Sir, the field where you planted the good seed is full of weeds. Where did they come from? An enemy has done this, the farmer exclaimed. Should we pull out the weeds, they asked. No, he replied. You'll uproot the wheat if you do. Let them both grow together until the harvest. Then I will tell the harvesters to sort out the weeds, tie them into bundles, and burn them, and to put the wheat into the barn. Now listen closely to what happens next. Then, leaving the crowds outside, Jesus went into the house. His disciples said, Please explain to us the story of the weeds in the field. Jesus replied, The Son of Man is the farmer who plants the good seed. The field is the world, and the good seed represents the people of the kingdom. The weeds are the people who belong to the evil one. The enemy who planted the weeds among the wheat is the devil. The harvest is the end of the world, and the harvesters are the angels. Just as the weeds are sorted out and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of the world. He's certainly pointing to a specific time here. The Son of Man will send his angels, and they will remove from his kingdom everything that causes sin and all who do evil. Who's getting moved? Those who do evil. And the angels will throw them into a fiery furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in their father's kingdom. Anyone with ears to hear should listen and understand. Wow, this is fantastic. The wheat is left. It isn't taken away. It isn't taken out. It is left and it is the evil ones who are taken out. The wheat and the weeds parable is not about the rapture of the church, but about the end of the age and how the unbelieving ones are going to be weeded out of this world in preparation for the millennial kingdom and the wheat which is left is going to enjoy the blessings at this age. In other words, only believers are going to be left to enter into the blessed kingdom. 
and only the believers being left, if there was a rapture at the end of the age, they would all be glorified in glorified bodies and there would be no natural people left on the face of the earth. But that is not what is being said here. There's no rapture here. And it's plain to see there's no rapture here because there's no church here. The believers saved during the seven-year tribulation are not people that are going to be raptured out of the world. They are people who, if they survive without being killed for their belief in God, are going to enter into the millennial kingdom alive, and they're going to be in their normal human body. They cannot have children if they have new bodies like we're going to have. And that's why there isn't a rapture in this case. There is a taking away uh, from the world of the evil. And, and of course, there are other scriptures that will come up later that actually show the, that the verses that we're using and we're attributing Jesus' words to the rapture it doesn't at all refer to the rapture. It refers specifically to this. The angels take them out. And we've called that the rapture verses. Not hardly. Jesus came preaching the gospel of the kingdom to Israel. He said, I was only sent to the house of Israel. He had a mission until they rejected him and crucified him. And the church, not even his disciples knew and understood the church was going to be a completely different program until it began, until he left them on the day that he ascended into heaven. Yes, he talked about it. Yes, he uh, promoted it. But he absolutely did not uh, fully explain the church age. And that's why he put them off and he said, hey, the Holy Spirit's coming. He will lead you and guide you into all truth. That's what it's talking about. It's talking about the full revelation of the, of the work that God was going to do in that age. So as an example of this, look at Luke chapter 17, verse 28. It says, it was the same as happened in the days of Lot. They were eating, they were drinking, they were buying, they were selling, they were planting, they were building. But on the day that Lot went out from Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. It will be just the same on the day that the Son of Man is revealed. On that day, the one who is on the housetop and whose goods are in the house must not go down to take them out. And likewise, the one who is in the field must not turn back. Remember Lot's wife. Whoever seeks to keep his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life will preserve it. I tell you, on that night there will be two in one bed. One will be taken, and the other will be left. There will be two women grinding at the same place. One will be taken, and the other left. Two men will be in the field. One will be taken and the other left. Now, it is this kind of scripture that leads people to think they're reading about the rapture. And if you would just read on, it becomes perfectly clear this is not about the rapture. In verse 37, the very next verse, it says, And answering, they said to him, those who heard him say these things, where, Lord? So the where, Lord, means they're taken. Where are they taken? And he said to them, where the body is, there also the vultures will be gathered. So this is explicitly explaining what we previously heard in the verse about the angels gathering the wicked and casting them into the lake of fire. They, they are killed, their bodies are discarded where birds can eat them in a pile and the birds feed upon them for months. And this is exactly what's taking place in this particular uh, verse. It's relating it to Lot and Lot's wife and what happened to Sodom and Gomorrah. And so you don't want to try to read in a rapture here because Jesus has not even revealed that there's going to be a church. Why in the world would he be talking about the rapture? He is still reaching Israel. He is still trying to be their Messiah. They are rejecting him. They did not recognize the time of his coming. And so what he's speaking about is 
about what is going to happen in the great tribulation. The preaching of the kingdom gospel is going to be these kind of things. The words that are being spoken here that will be appropriate during that time. That's why you will not find any of the apostles uh, or those who wrote scripture that we consider epistles in the New Testament referring to these things or applying them to the church because this isn't to the church and it never will be and it doesn't apply to the church. None of this does. And that's why you can't find Peter, Paul, James, and John talking about it or telling us to prepare as this is telling us. Okay, so after that, the next thing to do is to go to the Old Testament and see what in particular is this verse talking about. And all you got to do is go to Amos chapter 9, verses 1 through 4. That says, I saw the Lord standing beside the altar, and he said, Smite the capital so that the threshold will shake, and break them on the heads of them all. Then I will slay the rest of them with the sword. They will not have a fugitive who will flee or a refugee who will escape. Though they dig into Sheol, that's hell, from there will my hand take them, and though they ascend to heaven. So Amos is telling us um, that uh, this is the Lord bringing judgment and making sure that they're killed rather than that they flee. And though they ascend to heaven, from there I will bring them down. And though they hide on the summit of Carmel, I will search them out and take them from there. And though they concealed themselves from my sight on the floor of the sea, from there I will command the serpent and it will bite them. And though they go into captivity before their enemies, from there I will command the sword that it slay them, and I will set my eyes against them for evil and not for good. So here you go again, uh, an exact reference to what Jesus was speaking about uh, in uh, Luke. Now let's see what the reference in Zechariah is. And by the way, if you got a treasure of scripture knowledge, just go to Luke 17, 37 and look it up. These references are not things I am, uh, you know, making up here. This is, this is exactly what uh, is being referenced in the chain reference system. Uh, Zechariah 13, 8 and 9. It will come about in all the land, declares the Lord, that two parts in it will be cut off and perish, but the third will be left in it. And I will bring the third part through the fire, refine them as silver is refined, and test them as gold is tested. And they will call on my name, and I will answer them, and I will say, they are my people, and they will say, the Lord is my God. Now let's look at Zechariah 14 and 2. For I will gather all the nations against Jerusalem to battle, and the city will be captured, and the houses plundered, and the women ravished, and half of the city exiled, but the rest of the people will not be cut off from the city. So here you have over and over again an, an absolute connection to what is going on and to what is being talked about that Jesus is referring to. So when one is taken and the other left and the body is put and you'll find it where the vultures are circling, that's what vultures do to dead bodies. And then if you go to Revelation chapter 19, verses 17 and 18, it says, when I saw an angel standing in the sun and he cried out with a loud voice saying to all the birds which fly in mid heaven, come assemble for the great supper of God. And then in verse 18, so that you may eat the flesh of kings and the flesh of commanders and the flesh of mighty men and the flesh of the horses and those who sit on them and the flesh of all men, both free men and slaves and small and great. This is that. This is exactly what's taking place. And it's happening at the second advent of Christ. It's the angels that are going to gather these bodies together. It is this that is being spoken of. And this is what Matthew 24 and 25 is all about. These last days that are coming on the face of the earth. The hour of testing. The angels, when they come and they cast people into the lake of fire, they don't take the body and cast it into the lake of fire. They take the bodies and they kill them. And they kill them and they pile them into a pile in a particular place that has been prophesied to, to be where the dead bodies are. And um, they, the, the dead bodies 
are going to accumulate and they are going to, the birds are going to feed off them for months. There's going to be so many dead bodies. Entering into the, the millennial kingdom is going to be only believers. And so having a rapture when Jesus Christ returns would totally destroy the logic that there would be anybody left on the earth who doesn't go into heaven or up to meet the Lord and resurrect into new bodies. And then you turn around and the angels are going to kill all the non-believers and those who have taken the mark of the beast. And you've got a real dilemma on your hands. So I hope this has been helpful to you. This is my little short message to explain to you the difficulties with the post-tribulation argument. And um, if you have any arguments that you think can stand and and can um, uh, refute those things that I've said, I beg you, please feel free to write me. I am happy to hear your point of view. I speak as a fellow laborer in the work of God. I am not the one who wrote the Bible. I, like you, am trying to figure it out through diligent study and a very keen interest in these things. But I really, truly believe that if you're preparing for the Great Tribulation, you've really missed the point of what Scripture is saying when it says to have a hope, to be comforted in these things, to look at all the Scriptures that say that God has not appointed us to wrath, but, but he's going to rescue us and save us from that wrath. Uh, to notice that in the book of Revelation, there is no rapture uh, of the church mentioned. You can't find the church in the earth during the time of the, of the outpouring of the wrath of God through the book of Revelation from chapter 6 all the way to the end. You will not find the church uh, in the earth. Uh, you will only find that God is dealing with Jacob's trouble and what that means. And that is all intended to turn Israel to the Lord Jesus Christ as their Messiah. And when you get that message and you understand that the gospel of the kingdom is not the gospel of the church, Paul's gospel, the gospel of grace was not a kingdom gospel. That's why there are differences between how Jesus talked and how Jesus taught and how the apostles interpreted it for the church. Um, so there's many things that Jesus talked about that are very, very distinctly different that do not apply to the church. And one of those things is clearly looking at the Matthew 24 and 25 verses that speak at the end of the world or the end of the age. And he is speaking about a geographical area that is going to be Israel in the center of that area. He's talking about Israel, the Jews, the temple. Uh, The Jews themselves are going to be protected through the Great Tribulation. They are going to be the people of God who he is going to preserve. They are the the ones mentioned that uh, have the seal of God in their forehead. And he is going to make sure the Antichrist does not annihilate the Jewish nation, although I believe many Jews are going to die during that time. I think that God is going to save a remnant and those people are going to be blessed to go into the millennial kingdom and actually see the fulfillment of Abraham's promises and covenants that God had given to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and to David. All of these things are going to take place. And if you understand God's covenants with Israel and that they have never been fulfilled, you read Hebrews chapter 11 and you see that everyone died with the hope that they would be fulfilled. God is not a liar, that he is not like man who can make promises and not keep them. He makes his promises with the full knowledge that in spite of how difficult keeping them will be, he's going to bring them to pass. God bless you. Look for the coming of the Lord, not the coming of the Antichrist. Look for it to happen soon because there is craziness going on in our world. We can see the table being set. But we can never set a date. We can never know the time except that it's near. Jesus chided the Israelites because they didn't recognize the time of his coming. He said, you can look at the sun and watch and tell if it's going to rain the next day by the color of the sky. But you cannot perceive the times and the seasons of what God is doing. I believe those of us who are in the light can see that the day has almost dawned. And the day that's dawning for us 
is our salvation from the things to come, the terrible things that are going to come on the face of the earth. I am so glad I am a Christian. I'm so glad that God has given me the light of the gospel. And I'm so glad to share with you the good news that we have a blessed hope. And that hope is to listen for the trumpet of God to sound. It is going to be the clear sound of a call of God from this world to heaven to forever be with the Lord. Go back and read John chapter 14, verses 1 through 3. Look closely at what's being said there, and it will tell you that what Jesus is coming back to do for the church is to take them to heaven. He doesn't even come to the earth. We meet him in the clouds. There's a real good point for that. We meet him in the clouds because he's not there for the earth. He's there for us. God bless you. Maranatha. You've been listening to a Fathom Ministries podcast with me, Pastor Nathan Reynolds. You can find more podcasts and contact info at our website at www.fathomministries.org. Thank you for listening. You. Dead wrong to ever doubt you But my demons lay in wait and tempted me Without an overdose